<laughs> okay. So it's been a big year. It's hard to believe it's been a year, but I don't know if I speak for Heidi and Luke when I say that it was really helpful for me to sit down and reflect over the last 12 months and what I've been doing these last 12 months because I had a couple of disappointments, but also I've done a hell of a lot of stuff. And I'm really excited to tell you some of those stories and share those things with you here in the next 90 minutes or so. One thing that we would like to invite you to do is to, in the chat, what's one word that would describe how your year has been? Since we last saw each other, November 2022, how's your been? Your year been? Type that in the chat. Heidi, how would you say your year's been? Um, It's been a wonderful year. Yes, more <laughs> please, is how my year's been. <laughs> Luke, how's your year been? I mean, I would say exploratory if I was seeing it, because like there's a lot of tendrils out, some of which got stepped on, some of which are going places, but a lot of, you know, exploratory. What about you, Zach? I mean, chalk full. That one word or two, I don't know. You can, <laughs> if you're in the, you know, if you're in the South, you can hyphenate anything into one word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so let's do that. Chalk full. <laughs> we got folks saying unfolding, head wrecking. Sorry, Claire. We've been there. Growth-filled, transformation, beautiful, complicated, healing, lots more art, evolving, inspiring, challenging, but progress, productive, and celebratory. Well, I like all that. Mm. If that's not the human condition, I don't know what is. Lo Luke, I like your octopus analogy. I usually think of those moments as throwing crap against the wall to see what right. sticks. And that more positive thinking of an animal. I like that. The tentacle ear. <laughs> well, Zach got the tentacles in my brain, but also it makes it feel like you're sort of at a central hub and you're like pushing things out because the spaghetti is like, it's just, it's so like, far, you know, it's like over there is what's happening. But like, you know, I feel like I'm in this little bubble and I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see which tentacle gets tickled when you yeah. go that route. So can I show y'all something real fast before we begin? I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but I am working on a very cute little animal book. Uh, octopus. It's also got sequins. Sorry, the, <laughs> there we go. You see that? Oh, oh beauty. Amazing. So there's a cat on one page that feeds into the octopus. The octopus feeds into a couple of cutie little ants who are, I don't know, collecting crumbs, a little picnic. And it starts with a snake. And eventually it'll all loop back around. It's gonna be a big circular book that you can start anywhere you want to. There's no cover, oh. choose your own adventure. But that's what I'll be sewing on while we're talking. If y'all see me looking down, I am paying attention. Y'all know how it is. I don't gotta explain it. <laughs> We've done this thing before. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna be uh, embroidering my foot. I got a heel so far, but it's a, a foot in progress. That's a lot of stitches. You know it. I'm into this real dense running stitch lately. It's a nice way to just uh, have fun. Says yeah. you. Too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, are you working on anything at the moment? Or are you just giving us your full 100% undivided attention. attention? You know, I'm not a good attention divider. I would get too much into my project and I'd be down here and you tell me it's my turn to go. And I'd go, wait, what? What day is it? Yeah. Luke works efficiently with a machine and then he doesn't have to multitask with his hand. <laughs> All right. Well, Zach, do you want to take it away or should we do our quick yeah. introductions? We should do that. Oh, we do do that, don't we? Yes, um, please. We do. I forgot. <laughs> like putting on old pajamas. That yeah. We kind of forgot how they feel. <laughs> oh, okay. So if we're doing that, hi, I'm Zach. If we've never met Zach Foster, I make quilts out of almost entirely repurposed material. My exploration of the last year, and the one I'll be spending the bulk of my time sharing about today, is a body of work called Southern White Amnesia, which is the stories that white Southern white families tell about their origins and stories they don't tell about their origin. At least in the case of my family, it's more the latter. A lot I have found has been lost over time. So I've been trying to find ways to pull those back into textiles to share those stories. So that's me, thank you for being here. Heidi? Um, I'm Heidi Parks. I'm here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where there are green leaves on the trees and snow on the ground. <laughs> um, I'm glad I have electricity back in my house so we can be streaming to everyone that pooped out last night. 
and I am a quilter. I focus on hand quilting and mending clothing. And I do a lot of teaching, which has become international lately. And I, um, yeah, dabble in writing these days also. Luke. I'm Luke Haynes. Hello again, or hello for the first time. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, that's, I mean, I'm an architect using quilts as the, the language because um, uh, the, the big thing, and that's why we're in, you know, soft bulk is such an important conversation. Uh, quilts hold space. Quilts are sculpture, but they're also architecture because they are designed to be engaged with um, as, as physical objects in the world. Uh, that doesn't mean they have to be, but I think there's a, a beautiful history to them holding a space in a nice way. So uh, that's kind of my my soapbox and where I a lot of my exhibitions sort of start from and go into. And are we going to be seeing some of that in today's presentation? You don't have to spoil Yeah, whether we like it or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, good. We're here for it. That's why, that's why we signed up. <laughs> All right. Well, shall we? Yeah. Take it away. Okay. All right. Well, just like old times, folks, I get to go first. I don't even know how we decided that. Back in the day, a decision was made, and now we just, we're sticking to it. Okay. I do so, like being first. I do like being first. Because mm -hmm. then I get to, like, empty my brain out and listen to y'all share. You know what I mean? I'll be playing have to... background. Exactly. So a couple of just a quick things that I wanted just to share out to make sure we're on your radar if you're curious before we hop into talking about the many, many quilts I've made in the last 12 months. But just this morning, I released a new conversation on seam side with weaver Rachel McGinnis, who has a really interesting weaving practice that involves old vintage quilts. So check that out if either of those things sound interesting to you. I made this slide without knowing if Heidi would agree, but good news for us, she did agree. The quilt you're seeing on the screen right now is our finished collaboration quilt that we're calling Yes More Please. And I'm not gonna say anything more about it because I know Heidi's gonna touch on it. And soon on Seamside, Heidi and I are gonna have a quilt talk, a whole episode devoted to all the nooks and crannies of this quilt and the stories and intentions that we worked into it. So be on the lookout for that on Seamside. The Quilty Nook, I can't believe it, is turning two years old. <laughs> Terrible twos, I know, I know. So we have a um, full week yeah. full of free Thank you for events. Hope that it's, it's not splayed in a funny way. Here we go. We got a whole week full of free events coming up. Open house. All are invited. Tell your friends. Come see what all the fuss is about. There are things happening every day, but the two biggies are two workshops. And Nikki, I see you out there. Thank you, Nikki, for hosting the Scraps Workshop. Because if you're like me, you have tiny little pieces of fabric and you're like, what do I do with them? Nikki's going to give us some ideas that help us work with painting. Heidi sews those little tiny things down. Then on next, no, the Saturday of that week, Amanda Nadig and I are coming together for a workshop called Teasing the Thread, which started as a workshop about how to work in series, but it became bigger than that. So now we're interested in thinking about series, yes, but also how can I take the project I'm working on now, tease one little thread out of it, and use that as a jumping off point for a whole new project, which may become a series or it might not. So both of those two things are coming up on the note completely free. If you want to join, I will drop a link in the chat after my little section of this talk is done. Okay, thank you for letting me share that with you. Now, let's talk about Southern White Amnesia, shall we? What's funny about this is it started as one body of work, but it is um, morphed into three. And so we'll talk a little bit about the difference between the three. And it was something I didn't even realize until I sat down to make these slides, really. But it starts years ago, five or six years ago. I am the family historian of my family. I'm the one who does the research. I'm the one talking to the elders. I'm the one trying to connect all of these disparate threads together of our family history. And I remember about five years ago when I ran across the first records that some of my ancestors had enslaved people, right? And so here you see a very happy fellow, William H. Langston, who would have been my grandmother's grandfather's father. And here he is on what they call the slave census, which is a count of the number of enslaved people. And the only thing we knew about them is their age, whether they were male or female, according to the census taker, 
and their color, black or mulatto, would have been the two that they used. Um, seeing this was an absolute shock to me because I had never heard that my family had engaged in slavery. I mean, I guess I should have known because we come from generations in the South, but um, I just figured, I guess we would know, but more on that in a second. So I couldn't sit with these stories. I couldn't carry these stories on my own. That was the kind of thing that felt like it was starting to eat me up a little bit. So I wanted to turn it into a quilt. So I didn't know what to do with all of these stories floating around until a very fateful trip to the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska. I went to, as a keynote speaker for, uh, for an event on memory quilts. But the next day, oh, I got to meet Leslie Levy, who took me to the prairie, the ED for the museum, a sweetheart. The next day after I spoke, I spoke on a Thursday night last November, and then Dr. Carolyn Maslumi spoke on the next night, Friday night, and she was opening up an exhibit of quilts that she had collected over the years. And it was walking around these, the gallery, the two rooms that they had devoted to these quilts that I finally like got a framework that I felt like I could work with, with all these stories I was carrying around. So I'm thinking specifically of some of these pieces, like one by Clara Narti about Charlena, Marion Coleman, Tender Greens, Gwendolyn Ikea Brooks, Miss Ruby's Crown. And just because these details are astounding, I'll give you a couple of close-ups. Those are actual gloves that Miss Ruby wore to go cast her first vote for President Obama back in 2008. And then uh, Ed Janetta Miller didn't get a great picture of her piece that we see there. This is a, a woman though that she met in a, a clinic, a waiting room of a clinic in the height of the pandemic who had her mask down under her nose. and. Ed, Jeanette, and her just had this really beautiful conversation about how we keep each other safe and how we hold each other. So seeing how so many of these artists in this particular show were telling highly specific life stories, things that they had experienced firsthand, and they were turning that into textiles that pointed back to larger historical and universal trends, gave me a framework that I could work with, right? Because I, I feel like if I'm telling you my life story, which I'm, <laughs> I'm about to, uh, I, I have full ownership of that story. That's my story. Can't nobody tell me nothing about that story. But it also points back to larger his historical trends that involve all of us. And so as I share about this, I just want to say disclaimer up front, I'm talking about things sometimes for the first time. And I may use words that might not be the best word choice in the moment. Uh, if that happens, I'm going to say, <laughs> thank you in advance for your understanding if you have any feedback for me about the work or the presentation I take feedback as a sign of respect and I thank you ahead of time for that now this whole body of work started as Southern White Amnesia but then as I kept working I'm like mm, it's a little bit different these some of these pieces so I have a second set I'll talk about called American White Noise working title and then I was at Aramont and got inspired for a third called Country Spirit and it's so fascinating to um be thinking in this direction, it feels like exploring a room in the dark, you know, looking for the doors and you don't know where the walls are, the doors are until you actually get there and put your hands on it. And so I'm exploring Southern white amnesia, but then I'm also realizing, oh, but there's other stories to tell just about whiteness. And there's other stories to tell about the South that are related, but also separate. So here are three different ideas for ways to tease out work in, in what you're working on. now. Southern White Amnesia, the very first piece I made, this would have been last December, is called I Think We Would Know. And what you see here is it's a house dress, a pale pink house dress, a reference to white skin color, appliqued down directly on top of this vintage quilt that has Sunbonnet Sue and overall Sam on top of it. The words that you see reverse appliqued in that house dress, I think we would know, came from a family member who, when I first found those records I showed you a few minutes ago, my family member was like, oh, we didn't, we didn't enslave anybody. I think we would know. And that was such a aha moment for me. It made me wonder how many other Southern white folks are walking around just assuming that they would know that those stories would have made it down through the generation. And my answer to this, I, I should say the quilt's answer to me, looking at this Sunbonnet Sue is like, why would we know? 
Because like Sunbonnets, who so many of us aren't even pointed in the right direction. We're not even asking those questions about history and our own provenance and our own privilege and things like that. Some of us are, some of us aren't. Or overall, Sam has his back to us. I love the translucence of this well-worn house dress. It allows you to see some of the Sands and Sues behind it. And the backside is a thing of equal beauty, right? Because you can kind of read it in the negative space of the stitches. I don't know exactly what's gonna happen to this, but I think it's meant to be worn. So take a look at this cheesy 10 second video, give you an idea. I just love how this house dress becomes a cape and fits the body and it becomes something that like, when we think of what we think we should know, often that does become something that we um, cloak ourselves in and protect ourselves, cocoon ourselves with, whether or not that's actual fact or not. Now here's my sweet grandma. She passed back in July since the last time that we met. She's 107 years old. Her mom hand sewed, hand -sewed that Marie Webster quilt, windblown tulips. And she gave this to me. It's her dad, who's of the same Langston lineage that we've been talking about. I found his glasses recently cleaning up the house. So there's me and old Alva's glasses. And I also have his ring. I'm not wearing it now. Oops. But I wear it most every day. He graduated from Furman University. So that FU is for Furman University in 1904. He was a minister, went down to Brazil for 30 years as a missionary. And he's someone I find really fascinating because he would have grown up in a house where his father was raised alongside the people that they'd enslaved, right? So I am confident that Alva would have heard stories, but those stories have gotten lost as subsequent generations came, came about. Because I have so many questions for this particular ancestor, I did this one piece of textile art that is also a tool for dream work, right? So I embroidered this list of questions that I have for my great grandfather. And it says, Alva B, I am one of seven grandkids of your daughter, Skip, who is kind and brave even now at age 107. I know you must be so proud. I have so much underlined I want to ask you about somehow. Like, how did it feel to outlive your twin? Was Uncle Judd gay? Was he ever happy? What did your daddy tell you about growing up with slaves? What would you want? What made you want to become a missionary? What did the people of Brazil show you about life in America? And what did you do when you heard about the lynching? There was a lynching in his hometown what, just before he left for Brazil. That would have been big news. I'm just curious. We can't know, we can't know those conversations, right? But I would just be curious. There's a couple of close-ups for you. I slept with this for three nights under my pillow. The dreams were so intense. And I can tell you about the dreams another time. Uh, that just showed me that there are all sorts of data streams that we can plug into if we want to. I still have this piece. I just don't sleep with it under my pillow. It will come back at some point in time. The same family line, the Langston line, in the same town, Lawrence, South Carolina, deep in the woods off of one of these long meandering country roads, there's a family burial ground that inspired this piece that I'm calling Like Family. <clears throat> And like family comes from a story from the other side of my family, actually, my dad's side, where my mom would often talk about growing up with a black maid, a black nanny, who for them was, quote, like family. And I think that's such a complex term to explore. But it made, made for an apt name for this piece, because in this particular burial ground, which is now in the middle of a bunch of woods in upcountry South Carolina, I had to have somebody lead me back there. I'd never found it on my own. You get back in the woods and there's about a knee high stone, knee high stone wall that you can see surrounding these graves. And in the back of the walled in space, there's maybe a dozen or so ornately carved tombstones of my ancestors. They got Bible verses on them. They got doves, they got angels, they got all kinds of stuff, beautifully carved. But half of the walled in area looks empty. But if you look carefully, you see these indentations in the ground that are about six feet long and two feet wide. And they each had a rough rock at one end of them. And I asked the person who led me back to this, to this place, what's this about? And she says, oh, we assume those are the folks that your family enslaved. I was like, well, that's kind of messed up. <laughs> My ancestors get the nice stuff and they get the rough rocks. There's enough there, but there's more. 
if you walk outside the wall, there are other indentions throughout the woods immediately surrounding the wall, right? Six feet long, two feet wide, rough rock. So it's this idea of gatekeeping, even in the afterlife of white folks being able to, white folks setting up a system that allows some people in and keeps some people out. Here's a couple of close-ups for you. There's what you see me stitching on the right-hand side says milk and honey. And it's this quote from the author Cole Arthur Riley, AKA Black Liturgies on Instagram, who says, sure, maybe you can make it to the promised land on your own, but who will eat all that milk and honey with you? Which is a question I would like to ask my ancestors buried here. Who's hanging out with them in the afterlife? They have a lot of company or is it a little bit lonely? I don't know. In honor, in a way, create kind of a memorial space for these relatively unmarked graves. I have five different, I have five different crosses throughout this quilt with the name of the enslaved folks that I know belonged or were enslaved by this particular ancestor, my fifth great grandfather. So you'll see the names for Jane, Edie, Spencer, Adam, and Leah at different places on this quilt. Onus, AKA on us. Oh, that slide's a little funky there. This particular, well, I'll show you some close ups in a minute. This particular piece, the, the dark silhouette shape that you see in the middle, was a button up shirt that I found in the middle of the intersection here in my neighborhood, just a few blocks away. And it must have been there for weeks because it was flat as a pancake, right? And when I unfurl it, or whatever you would call that action, it had the most remarkable bleaching patterns. And you can see that on the left. And what became really interesting to me as I was working with this material is thinking of all the lives that this garment has lived. We see it side by side, all on one plane together, right? We know that cotton originally is kind of a creamy color like the feed sack you see on the right-hand side. That would have been the first life of this particular olive colored garment. The second life, it would have been bleached bright white. And you can see that towards the left-hand side. Maybe I can even give us a little pointer here. Yeah, I don't know, okay, I can't do that. Oh yeah, here we go, maybe y'all can see that. Um, these bright white parts would have been the creamy cotton bleached white. That would have been its second life. Then it would have been dyed olive green, third life. Then it would have been bleached by the sun, fourth life. And then there are words here, and there are marks I made with discharge paste. That had been the fifth life. And all of these lives fit side by side in this one garment. So onus for me is a way of thinking about when someone says, oh, but it was so long ago. It meaning slavery days, right? It was so long ago. I think, and, and scientists I think agree with me to think about time. There's this theory about block time that says everything exists at once in this universe, right? It just depends on how you slice the block, where you are in time, but everything is constantly existing. We see that here in this garment, and I'm wondering to what extent that's we, we can pick up on that in this life. These two symbols and the words that you see here came from Civil War era letters from my family. I had some great grandparents who sent seven sons to the war. Six of them did not make it home. One of them was really keen on signing off his letters with, when this you see, remember me. I mean, here he is at 17 years old, already worried about being forgotten, right? He would draw these little doodles on some of his letters. You see this kind of, I call it a tree of life. I don't know what he would have thought. And there's a, two interlocking hearts that I think are really sweet. So remembering, remembering, remembering is so important. Now, another piece here in Southern White Amnesia. This one says, I got this silver dollar from my granddad. And if you look close, there it is. I just stitched that down in the traditional style of Persian mirror work. So that's the actual silver dollar right there. That's Dwight D. Eisenhower's ears sticking out the hole. And this is an interesting, um, when I realized this about my own family, I thought this would be an interesting thing to explore visually. And that is, mm, here we see one way of representing familial relationships, right? Most of us are familiar with the family tree. The only problem with that graphically is that it spreads out far too long, right? It gets sprawling really quickly, but a fan like this keeps it nice and close. And you see two kinds of information here. You see the pink 
you see the blue and you see the everything else. To help you decipher it, because I'm here with you to kind of work it out, the pink are the ancestors that enslaved other folks. So I would be in the bottom left-hand corner that says me down there. I don't know if I have a, there we go, right? And then you see my mom and dad and we work our way out to great grandparents who were involved in, in slavery. The blue portions are the members of my family who had access to higher education. So we can see that my family, there's a direct correlation between folks that had the wealth to enslave other people and their own benefit and access that they were able to pass on to their children all the way down to me in this current day, right? I am a, I inherited this privilege. Now, my dad, on the other hand, check that out, was first generation college student. And look where he came from. Long line of subsistence farmers, right? His dad before him had only made it to the eighth grade. My grandma graduated high school. She was pregnant at the time and got married right away, right? So this is, in my family, we see very interesting through lines, I think are indicative of much larger historical trends here in this country. You may remember this piece. Uh, I was trying to give us a visual for how in, in 10 generations, we all have 2,046 direct ancestors. That's 2,046 parents, grandparents, great grandparents, et cetera. I am not counting aunts and uncles. I am not counting cousins and siblings, right? just direct ancestors. That's a hell of a lot of people. I get all the way through, so down 2,046 little squares and decide I didn't like it. So I took it all out. I had a better idea, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But I used that same quilt in this project. And this is one that's still kind of living in limbo. I don't know what its final stage is gonna be, but I got this flag. Oh, that flag, there's a whole story in and of itself. So, Okay, I got a couple minutes. Uh, but anyway, so this this flag was actually uh, left for me and my partner, my friend at a campsite where we were camping by three folks who colloquially might have been called good old boys. We'd had a little rift the night before about the level of noise coming from their campsite. And the next morning, we found this American flag tied very tightly to a tree facing our tent. And it was all just very odd and menacing and threatening. So I kept the flag. I'm like, oh, how can I pull in this menacing energy? And so this seems like one way to do it. Because one thing I've been thinking about is what had to happen in my white ancestors' minds to get to a place where they were willing to engage in slavery, where they were willing to look at another human being and say, nope, you're not fully human. I can enslave you and I can exploit your labor. They must have turned something off. What was that cost? to them, the psychological cost to them, which gets me thinking about what are the intergenerational trickle-down effects, right? Hence the question that you see on the screen, is it possible I am descended from generations of sociopaths? It's a little bit clickbaity, but it's also 100% true. I mean, this is a thing I'm wondering about. And if I'm descended from generations of sociopaths, what work do I need to do to flip the script? So I don't know exactly how this piece is gonna live in the world. Here's one way, I kind of like the idea of a canopy. Um, Here's a short little video showing you how you can interact with it. I like giving people a space to get uncomfortably close and get up inside. You can see all those black threads that originally held down those 2,046 ancestors, but now I'm questioning perhaps their, their, their mental wellness and mental health. So that's Southern White Amnesia. That's the biggest body of work to date. Now, the second collection is a little bit smaller and I'm calling it now American White Noise because they're not strictly stories about my family, but they are more, I'm gonna say, of pieces that attempt to capture my evolving understanding of what it means to be a white person in this country in 2023. So I'd like to start with this piece I made at Penland back in January. If you've never done the, if you're ever looking for a two week or four week getaway, the Penland Winter Residency is beautiful in Western North Carolina. And I made a lot of pieces there. This is one of them. This one's called, called Our Children, and it tells a story. It is this little allegory of how whiteness passes from one generation to the next. And it starts with, our children are born with a snake in their crib. Take that in for a second. Our children are born with a snake in the crib. And when I say our in this body of work, this is a body of work mm -hmm primarily focused or geared towards other white folks so that we can engage in this conversation. So we can think about how is our privilege and our whiteness collectively held, right? 
in in the color of our skin and people have the same skin color. So our children are born with a snake in the crib. This guardian serpent whispers silver tongue seeds into the open ears of our children that bloom later in life. Whispers like, and these are all lies, right? I don't gotta tell you this, these are all lies. Whispers like, all this belongs to you. Whispers like, you have all this because you work so hard. Whispers like, they don't work hard like you do. These are lies that I've heard in a thousand different iterations over the course of my four decades on this planet. And so I wanted to encourage people to think a little bit about what kinds of stories and messages are they receiving? With the thinking about Snake in the Crib, this is uh, a piece that is inspired by all those Sunday mornings I sat in church at the Southern Baptist Church where I grew up looking at the church banners on the wall and maybe not listening as closely to the preachers my mom would have liked. And so this is a church banner style piece. It's a call to action, snake handler, now take up thy serpent today. All of these pieces, all this material is bought in a single shopping trip in Spruce Pine, North Carolina. And we had a quilt raising. So that was one piece. This one is a work in progress. I found these three green towels at the Goodwill bins one day and they're all folded up and stacked together. And immediately I had these two like simultaneous connections that were made for me at the stack of towels. One is that towels are very intimate objects, right? They deliberately cover our nakedness a lot of times. Two, they were three different shades of American currency. And so I really found myself thinking a lot about body and intimacy and economy and money and finance, all these things. And so I worked with these towels directly to make these two pieces. Maybe they go together. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But it says, touch your white body. What does it profit? In 2023, what does it mean? What advantages does having skin color like this get you? And how can we leverage that advantage for the good of all, right? And how can we begin to dismantle that, that advantage as well? I love the texture of sewing with terry cloth. It will not be the last time. This is a piece that is built on top of an old quilt from my partner's grandmother. She made this for my father-in-law. And what's so fascinating to me about this piece is that it's a, uh, kind of like an alternative clock or an alternative calendar. She batted this quilt with an old chenille blanket. You know, I had like these ridges of stitches. And so what happened over the 75 years of its existence is that it created this really interesting pattern of abrasion that wore through the patchwork, revealing the chenille, stitch, the chenille stitching underneath it. And so I wanted to find a way to show, to draw your attention to this one particular point of abrasion and to, to hopefully invite you to reflect a little bit about how decisions, things set in motion years and years ago continue to this day to have an effect. So I used, I covered the whole quilt with four yards of black silk chiffon, cut out this little window so that you could really just like focus, laser in on it. There's a close up. And then there's just, just to show you like, that's how the idea started and to show you where it ends. Sometimes it's just, it's a lot of play, right? It doesn't all work. Okay, and now we're wrapping up, we're coming around this last corner, Country Spirit. I've only got one piece in this collection, uh, which is probably a good thing because I need to be focusing on the first two. But uh, remember the piece at all the, the 2046 black squares. The better idea I had, that I wish I'd had earlier, but oh well, is to create some kind of 3D sculptural model that would really give you a sense of how big your family gets so quickly when it doubles every generation. A grid of black squares didn't do that. It gave you a sense of bulk, but not of exponential growth. And so I wanted to make this mobile of all these little quilt scraps, 2046 little quilt scraps that would essentially funnel out, right? And get really, really big by the time you get to the 10th generation. Okay, so that was the intention when I went to Airmont. I got invited to go to the Spring Pentaculum in May for a week in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. But I got so, uh, if you've been to Airmont, it's a beautiful place. 
Gatlinburg's a beautiful place. I love spectacle. I love over the topness. I love gaudiness. I love tacky. I, it's all good. However, I couldn't shake the very real senses. I'm walking down the streets of Gatlinburg that uh, everybody I was seeing just felt cut of the same cloth and in such a way that didn't feel like it let, let in much room for anybody else that wasn't cut from that same bolt of cloth, you know? And so that energy was just very present, very heavy for me. And so I put this mobile aside, scrapped it and said, I'll deal with you later. I don't have the what it takes to deal with you right now. And I just went to the textile studio, uh, to the scrap bins they have, and just started grabbing colors, just kind of willy nilly, wasn't even thinking too much about it. And it's not even a typical color palette for me in some ways. But I just started sewing straight down in the batting, just getting these pieces down, just trying to keep the hands busy and discharge the, the funk somehow, you know? Here's a couple more details. And what is so interesting to me, when I got home, I didn't even realize this, but what's so interesting to me is when I got home, here you see my quilt on the right, cuddling up with my partner's grandmother's quilt on the left. This is the quilt that we keep on our bed. And so at a point where I was experiencing a lot of, we'll call it psychic duress, I made myself a comfort object. I made myself something that tapped into Mama's maternal healing energy and that come for me in that time and that none of that was intentional but I think damn that's a, that's a beautiful story that's a beautiful story I'm very thankful for both of these quilts and the title of this third collection comes from the the name for this line of fabric country spirit and so what I see country spirit being as a collection is there is so much to love about the South, there's so much to love about the country, there's so much to love about small towns, all of these things. But not everybody has equal access to feeling comfortable in those spaces. And so how can we continue thinking about new South or new country, or how do we continue to make these places where anybody who wants to live there can and feel comfortable and feel welcome and feel accepted and be a member of those communities? So I'm trying to think of how do we think about the South? How do we continue thinking about the South in a way that keeps everything we love about it? Banana pudding, bluegrass music, all sorts of stuff. How do we keep that, but also make room for other people? So that's country spirit, and that's where I'll be going with that. So thank you for letting me share um, a lot of these stories I told for the first time. So I, I hope that they strung together into something that made sense for you. It's been I've been hesitant to share a lot of these quotes online only because I feel like they need context. Like you need to hear me talk about it, I think, to know how they all fit together, to know whether I view a work as complete or incomplete. Cause some of these, like I said, are, you know, they're just stuck in the middle somewhere. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just close with what I, what I open with, I suppose, which is talking about these things can be a little bit tricky, sensitive, and I'm not the best person always to do that. You know, tongue gets tied sometimes. So if, if there's any feedback you have for me, just know that I would take it as a sign of respect and I appreciate it ahead of time. I'm going to pass the mic to Heidi. I'm also gonna drop some links in the chat. So if you're at all interested in catching the seam side episode that I mentioned at the beginning or joining us for the open house on the Nook, we would love to see you in either of those spaces. Well, can we chat for a bit, Zach, since we don't yeah. have to zoom into a, um, a celebrity? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do, you mind, do you mind very much if we instead take a moment after? I mean, I just like, I've got at least what look, I've got so many questions and maybe yeah. far more than we need today with a big audience. But uh, the, the biggest one that I think would be really fascinating to hear um, and sort of have an audience for is is a very big question and so you don't have to take it in its breadth but um and i'll try to ask it in a way that that conveys what i'm asking is where do these go right so these are very personal objects they're objects now so they're personal ideas um you know in this sort of idea of existing as an artist it's a way for us to process our experience visually and tactily and spatially and you know all of that sort of stuff they tell you in second grade that art is, art is right art therapy right uh and it's and it, a lot of that's true but it's also so much deeper um you know you're you're creating these very very hyper specific experience objects 
Um, now, what we think of as artists also has this connotation and denotation of selling these objects and making money and putting them on art walls to impress people or educating people through these object exploration exhibitions, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, that's that's a really big question to say, like, where do these go and what does that mean? Beautiful question couple of thoughts for you right off the bat is one this is not work I can ever sell right this is work exploring how my family benefited from exploiting the labor of other people and so for me to make money off of telling that story is impossible like I'm not trying to do that at all in fact what, what I'm thinking what I'm trying to do is to I mean Maybe this is too soon to say, but in my mind, I'm thinking of these as kind of like reparation quilts or like ways to raise funds to get back to communities who can use those funds. So like maybe I would gift the quilt to a donor who endowed a certain charitable organization or something like that, right? So that's one thing I'm thinking about financially. Now, where physically do they go? I would love to see them travel the world wouldn't be the worst thing um i i don't see them in galleries just because i feel like one i don't really know gallery space in that world as well as you and heidi uh but i also feel like the stories i want to tell i want to get them in front of people like me and my family right who are good well-intentioned people but we don't always haven't always had the time or the bandwidth or the invitation to explore and think about these questions so i see them uh maybe in like libraries or maybe strip malls or maybe hanging up in parks or just places where they'd be easily accessible. Yeah, interesting. Let's, I mean, look, I do that all the time. So if you ever want to team up, I'm real happy to share what resources that I have and or help you hang them in a park. Um, Cause I think that that's such an interesting uh, portion. And just to, just to say this also, we live in a different world than the world that came up with uh, ecclesiastical paintings, right? Like you would make you, you one, an artist would make a painting. And if you were lucky enough, you did it for the church because the church is where people go and they could see your art and you've made it, you've done it solid. That's the most people that will ever see it in the world. You just, and maybe you're, you've done it at the best church, the Sistine Chapel. So you are the best artist of all time because you're at the biggest church, blah, 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 right? Um, now you can take a picture of something. Like for example, far more people have already seen pictures of my work then we'll ever see the objects in my lifetime by probably a factor of a hundred, right? And so we've got these objects, but now we have a different conversation with them, a different audience, both um, in terms of depth, that's a really shallow depth, but it's also a very broad depth in different ways. And so it's just interesting to think about, right? Like you making an object and then sharing pictures of that object is going to be where it gets to, right? So like, what what are all those conversations? And not to say that we have to have them, but I think it's a, a fascinating one, right? Like, I, I, I've i never seen any of them, uh, of these pieces, and I may only see a few of them in our lifetimes. And I'm one of the lucky few who gets to hang out with you in real life, right? And so uh, I think it's just really interesting to go through all of the deep thought, hand process, um, mental process to create these objects into the world um, for for few people for for the the sort of select people to see them and then you get to sort of leverage that into conversations and it's really it's dynamic and it's got me thinking that's all. Mm. Um, Thank you, I I would love to just add to the conversation that it's so nice to get to sit and listen to you for a while about these pieces and to see them in context with the stories. And it just really makes sense to me that it's a different experience from what we often see on Instagram where, you know, you did share the beautiful quilt that you made with your grandma's robe and another recent memory quilt. And it's just fascinating to see you navigating multiple different social media platforms and spaces and, you know, where these stories can, can be shared on your podcast and, and just that choosing of where and how to tell stories and invite that complexity is just fascinating in addition to what happens with the object itself, but like where and how are you telling the story is so interesting and rich. And, and I feel very lucky to be getting to see 
that deeper level of your practice here. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've had to do a lot of reflection in the last year of how to tell stories, right? Because before this year, before this collection, I was just sharing everything I made on, on Instagram. Like there was just, there was like no filter really. You know, I was just, if I was making it, I was sharing it. But this is just, it's too nuanced and it's too sensitive and it's too charged and it's too complex. It's too all the things. We just need a spot like softball where we can engage in kind of longer form storytelling. And I think I'll end with this and I'm gonna read the questions in the chat. But one piece I'm really interested in moving forward in the future is I have contacted a storyteller, a professional storyteller named Elizabeth Ellis out of Texas. She is incredible. I got to see her live once and she commanded court without ever having to stand up from her folding chair. And so I am going to be working with her at some point to develop stories like, you know, like a a library of stories or whatnot for each of these pieces that I can tell along with the piece. So that's something new too that I hadn't been thinking about in those terms. Zach, you'll have to put a link for her in the chat too. I know you're about to add a whole bunch of links. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> I want to be Googling her too. Um, all right, beautiful. Well, I will share my screen. And I love that you've landed with storytelling because that is a big link between us. And, and so I'm going to do a little bit of a, a refresh of things that were maybe at the tail end of our previous episodes. And then I've got two special uh, things to share about and doing a little bit of a recap on my year. So um, this is a diary quilting diary quilt that I made back in 2020. And it's just been a very interesting place for me to stay creatively. I feel like I've been living in this place of diary quilting for a while and it's continuing to keep me on the edge of my seat. So here's one from 2020. And then this is the one that I'm sewing my foot on right now while I'm watching and listening to you too. Uh, this is a quilt that I made about 2022. So here it is in January and loops all the way down over to December. And in the background, you can see I was teaching in France recently and brought this quilt there. Um, this is a quilt that I made uh, while traveling in Santa Fe, New Mexico and teaching there. And I was reflecting on my grandma Mimi, who turned, gosh, 92 or 93 recently. I think 92. <laughs> um, and, and this quilt is in, it's part of Quilt National. So it was recently on exhibition in France and is continuing to tour around. This friend I made while I was with Zach teaching in Wisconsin. And uh, I'm hoping to do another retreat in 2025 at Woodland Ridge Retreat. So um, more Wisconsin retreats are in my future. This is both a diary quilt, but also casting a spell about the eye floaters that I have and wanting them to improve or be less noticeable for me. And this is another quilt casting a spell, number eight in that series, uh, which was more of a domestic life spell that I wanted to cast. And I'm also next to my dad's jeans that are um, currently on display through November 4th at the James Watrous Gallery. It's really exciting to see work connected to both my sweetheart and my dad um, on display there. And this is some big news. I've been doing a very gentle, soft launch for these two new projects. And so there's still plenty of space left um, in this offering where I am going to be teaching in Sardinia, Italy this summer in July. It was so fun to get to travel to France to teach. I had been supposed to teach in France in 2020 and I wasn't able to. And so now uh, it was just a thrill to get to do that in 23. And so in July, I'll be teaching um, here. Sardinia is an island off the coast of Italy, uh, kind of even with Rome, north of Sicily. And this is the yoga shala that we'll be staying in. And I will be teaching yoga in the morning. And then in the afternoons, we'll be sewing together. And we've got several beautiful excursions on boats and hiking and a lot of physical fitness things that we're up to. 
This is a 15, 20 minute walk from our hotel. It's the Tower of Bari Sardo. There are a lot of towers in Sardinia. And so that's the beach where we'll be hanging out and exploring. And this is a little throwback to baby Heidi from 2006. Um, I used to go to Sardinia. Uh, I went a few times and it was just so beautiful. I remember it vividly with the way the rocks were and the water. And um, it's part of, part of why I'm excited to go. There's this feeling of in my diary quilts in general of nostalgia and reflection and cognitive reframing of looking back at something and figuring out, um, is the story that I'm telling about the past an accurate, healthy story? And could I maybe rewire or reframe that story to be more healthy and truthful, which is very similar to the work that you're doing with Southern White, White Amnesia, Zach, that um, looking back at the past. And so it's literally a place that I used to spend time in that I haven't been to in a long time. And also just such an exciting part of future dreams of being able to teach abroad in beautiful locations. And this is uh, this last set of photos of Sardinia is in a town called Argazolo. And there they have murals um, that are just everywhere. And it's so beautiful seeing this mural uh, of the more traditional, a saint, and then next to him, the more contemporary murals that are there in, in the city uh, in Argoslo. So um, I'm very, very excited about that trip. I've got three links, so I'll pop all three of them in there. The second link is this Sardinia trip. And um, in as well, that spirit of looking back and noticing the present moment and anticipating, you'll remember episode two of Soft Bulk. I shared this idea of taking Polaroid pictures to help me stay in touch with um, the pacing of things that I'm doing. And so here I am taking photos of most of the things as I finish them. I forgot a little bit and I made some drawings instead just to stay truthful with how much progress I'm making. And, um, you know, it's been fun to see this practice evolve over three years now. And hopefully I'll get at least two more quilts at the bottom of this one in 2023 before the end of the year. But um, this idea of thinking about the year as a container, just like I was looking back at 2021 and made a quilt about it, has been very helpful for me. And so that's my second project that I'm very excited to share about, which is a year-long class that I'm going to be teaching. I took a similarly priced and energy requiring course from Janelle Hardy, who Zach, you and I both know her. She teaches a lot about personal myth-making and memoir, and I am going to be teaching a year-long class on quilt making. The class is hopefully going to be in scope and challenge, similar to a single college level class. I obviously am not a college, but when you're thinking, do I have it in me to sign up for this class, and, and do I hope to feel some changes at the end? That is the goal that I'm headed for. We're going to do <clears throat> pre-recorded learning. We're going to meet live in very small groups of 10 people. And we're going to have some optional larger group co-working sessions on Zoom. We're going to use a mighty network. So similar to the Quilty Nook. And I've gotten some wonderful insights and advice from being a nooker and from using the Mighty Network in Janelle's class as well. This will be a closed circuit uh, Mighty Network. So the current students and also hopefully into the future, the alumni from the course will be on that network and sharing and using those social media capabilities to share things without any advertising or endless scrolling loops that you can accidentally get sucked into. And it'll be a great way to just feel engaged throughout the entire month rather than just that live meeting. And then also I'm going to be pairing students up to work with each other. And yes, I'm very hopeful to be doing this as a regular ongoing thing. So think about 2025, Esteban. Thank you for mentioning that. 
Um, I have, and Ben, you're here. I'm so excited that you're in the, the Tuesday class. So thank you for sharing about that. We have nine students signed up so far. There's room for 30. Um, and, and so I'm just going to share with you a little bit about my year and hopefully how that matches with this idea of a year long course. Um, I finished the third in a series of white scrap quilts. And here you can see me wrapped in the second in the series of white scrap quilts. This um, magazine came out early spring, which means January, <laughs> early spring. <laughs> and, and so here, um, or maybe it wasn't quite January, that might be a stretch, but um, it's an ongoing series. And it's something that allows me to mentally take a little step back from some of the diary quilting, working just with geometry and white scraps. There's a lot of thinking about use and scraps, but it also, in terms of the making, I, I can sit down and make and not have a lot of ideas that I have to consider so deeply. I'm able to just deal with and observe the scraps and that type of project is helpful. Um, this year I, I did a fair amount of commissions. I'm working on a third commission of the year right now. And um, commissions are currently closed. So I'm not advertising for that, but it's fun. And I know Zach can relate to, I think both of you can relate to this idea. That sometimes commissions are super welcome. And then other times it's like, oh no, I got some things I need to focus on. I can't be spread that thin. So it was so joyful to make these. Uh, and, and then so joyful to be like, oh, you know what? I need to take a step back. So it's nice, um, nice pacing that way. Here I had a solo show at an art museum for the first time. Very exciting in Wausau, Wisconsin. This was centered on reuse and repurposing things. Our friend Sherry Linwood from, I believe, episode four had a quilt upstairs because the, the exhibition that they had in that other gallery was on... Uh, the San Francisco dump project. And she made a quilt for that. And so we got to pull quilts from my, my work that had a real focus on repurposing and using things with found objects and incorporating them in the work. So um, that was really exciting. Another repurposing moment is I mended these jeans for my sweetheart, Bo in February. He uh, used to love them and hadn't worn them because they're getting too thin. And now they are on display at the James Watrous Gallery. So here you can see them floating. They're actually held up with some buttons. They drilled some holes in these dowel rods and used a button to hang it. And I was so enchanted. And it's wonderful to be in this very contemporary setting with lots of different ways of thinking about mending. The exhibition is called Mend the art, the work of repair. And, and so interesting, that choice of work. <clears throat> then I made some brooches and mainly repurposed some spice lids and milk bottles and, and did some, some playful things with magnets. And that's a class on my website now. I also made some, I returned to this practice of making small works. And so in the long year long series that I'll be teaching, there's a month where we're going to focus on small studies and that could be a watercolor or a collage doesn't have to be sewing. But for me, these small works of sewing helped me bust through creative ideas. And sometimes if I get stuck or I just like need a finish because I've been making work for other people with commissions and I need something that's mine. Um, I actually made some of these while I was hanging out with Zach and Amanda Nadig in Chicago um, or did some some work on them. So. Uh, because it's November and I remember vividly having a helpful soft book conversation about sales and how that works, putting things on sale. Um, so this November, my small quilts and my large quilts on my website are on sale for 25% off with this quilt 25 code. And then here's a diary quilt that I made. I began this in November and finished it during my artist residency in Wausau in July. So it was a long haul of a, a diary quilt, partly because I was doing commissions and other projects in the background while I was working, or this was in the background while I was working on some other things, but it marked the moment of me turning 40. 
and um, yeah, just has has so much, so many rich topics in it. I probably need to do a special episode on on my YouTube channel just explaining all the backstory. I was trying to write about it for my QuiltCon application just recently, and pairing it down, pairing those words down was a real challenge. And you know, those are some other things that we'll be talking about in the year long class as well is how do you talk verbally about your work? What words do you choose to use? How do you get more comfortable with spitting out efficiently verbally what you're up to? And then also working on writing about your quilts, whether it's for an application like what I was just doing or for a family log or when you're giving something as a gift, what words do you use to describe it in the card that you give someone? So um, this is a new creative bug quilt pattern of mine. It's called the Love Letter Quilt. Uh, it was very challenging to make a quilt in secret and then reveal it, but uh, very rewarding then once it finally gets revealed. And I've been making some clothes for myself. You can see I'm wearing my quilted tank top and mended sweater. And I made myself a new purse, which can be a side bag and can even be a um, backpack. And those wooden slats are an idea that I got from my great aunt June with a purse that I started to borrow from my mom when I was in high school. So it's a, a really fun thing that I'm hoping to maybe be able to share both of these as patterns or classes in the future. We'll see how that comes to pass. And then here, yes, more please. And some of the, I would say my word for the year that I've been repeating is streamline. Like how can I streamline what I'm doing, not get spread too thin, but joyfully be involved in a variety of projects too. And so we are, um, Zach and I are very excited to be um, in the point in our careers that we're in. It's just a very, very exciting place to be. I feel so lucky to be in a sustainable place as a professional quilter. It was not always the case at all whatsoever. And so I'd like more of that. And then Zach texted me this funny text. He's like, I thought this was our year of no. <laughs> and, and so we'll have more on that in our podcast episode, but it was very special to get to collaborate with you on a quilt. Uh, I also took a class on this Japanese technique of chiku chiku, and I'll be teaching a sold out class in Japan this April. So it's fun to get more in touch with that technique. And this cotton is so thick. It is thick like sugar and cream cotton that you would crochet a washcloth out of. And because of that, I got inspired to do some quilting with yarn. So used a lot of hand yoga. I used my Dyson non-slip gripper things and uh, did some quilting with yarn and then pooped out and thought, I'm done. I'm going to quilt with machine, machine thread now. But I made this wonderfully textured quilt that I'm real excited about, which is another uh, kind of mental space holder of getting to work on this piece, which is called Neutrality Study Number 5. So staying in touch with, for me, what feels joyful is a mix of really introspective, thoughtful work, and then also things that are a little bit more aesthetic. Um, here's a little hint at my pink diary with a padlock that I had as a child. This is my current quilt that I'm working on, which is the very last bit that I'm sharing about today. Um, so here, I got all these teeny tiny bits of applique in matching fabric. And this is my was my studio a little while ago. You can see where this quilt was in its completion process. And I had an intern, which was amazing. Highly recommend. Maya Rao was my intern. And uh, we tidied up my workspace. It looked so nice. It's a little more lived in now as I look out from the same table. But um, I was really interested in that idea of the cleaning up that we were doing. And there's some deep things that we did that are very much still in effect in this room, even though there's things happening. And so I liked that idea of putting like with like and matching things. So like verbing that activity of what I was doing. So I've got lots of little bits of applique here. 
And now as I'm continuing this quilt, I was sharing yesterday that I have finally used some of my dad's clothing in a quilt. This is my first time cutting up one of his plaid shirts. Pretty much all of his shirts were plaid shirts and they are in the top left corner of this quilt. And I'm just so, so excited to be working on this particular diary quilt. It's really depicting this room. This yellow line is a map of my living room. And I worked on this with my students in person in Wisconsin in August. And also this past month in October with my diary quilting students. So I was able to work with them and we had a wonderful week. I'm very excited to offer diary quilting again. The next time I teach it, it might be spread out over two months rather than concentrated in as a one month class, but it, it was extraordinary. Uh, certainly checking out that hashtag of HP diary quilt would be a worthwhile thing to dig into as well as I've been putting more effort into Pinterest, which is a way to say my intern Maya put a lot of effort into Pinterest this summer. And, and so I've got a beautiful uh, Pinterest page that's highlighting the work that's being made in these diary quilting classes. Um, yeah, so it took me five years. My dad passed in 2018. And this is the first time I'm using his, his clothes. And it just, it feels like a nice new phase to be at. Um, in, in that, you know, lifelong process of loving and grief. And here's the beginning of my heel that I'm working on now. So it's exciting to see that that dense yellow running stitch is showing up at a distance. So I hope that you will consider quilt making with me. Um, these three themes of aesthetics, curiosity, and efficiency are important in the class. And again, it's you're going to be a rigorous class, be ready to do some work, but also there are a lot of ways that you can get caught up. If you get behind, you, um, you know, can, can, can miss class once in a while because life happens. The class was curated around my personal calendar so that I could attend all of the events. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled. We've got, um, I think now 10, 10 students in class and yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a really exciting, empowering thing for me. And I even, I see some students from Diary Quilting here. And one of the common questions that comes up is like, what am I missing because I didn't go to art school? And how can I find, you know, you don't know what you don't have. Zach, you were even mentioning, just like, oh, I'm not as familiar with art galleries as Luke and Heidi, therefore I'm making a different choice. And I, I, I agree, <laughs> but you don't know that when you're not also there. So for me, a big part of it is, um, you know, just trying to unpack some of that mystery and share with students um, a nice synthesize. And also, God, I was tired when I was in art school. I was tired all the time and I got so sick during part of school. And to spread one class out over a year, I feel like you'll be able to really suck the marrow from the class in a way that five classes in a semester, I personally was not able to back back when I was in school. So thank you. Oh, Matt, Zach, you're muted. Okay, well, when your quilt making class, whenever you offer the, here's everything I learned in art school yeah. episode, I want to come to that one. You just let me know. I'll be <laughs> I'll there. You can be a special guest. <laughs> the one who says, I know nothing. <laughs> I'm here to learn. <laughs> Although I will say, I mean, I've been on the road a lot in the last year and I met a number of different artists, which has been phenomenal. And now it's changed my relationship to not having gone to art school because I also see that there's, it can also be, I've heard various iterations of it's also liability of sorts, right? Like there's a certain kind of undoing that some people feel like they have to do after art school. So like it's, I'm like, oh, okay. It's, it's like anything, there's, there's pluses and minuses, right? You know, I, I also feel like this would be an incredible class for someone who just graduated from art school, because I certainly at that time found myself in a state of, you take a class for a semester, you explore some your professor's ideas, and then the next semester you put on a different hat and you figure out a different thing. And I, I remember graduating and just thinking, if if someone would just tell me what to focus on, 
what to make, which of these many things I'm interested in to pursue, I'd be so grateful. You know, no one can tell you, but what I hope to offer with this class is an unpacking of how do you figure out what it is that you're passionate about? How do you get closer to your own aesthetic, the things that genuinely pique your own curiosity? And, you know, life is short. How do you choose what to invest your energy in and how do you make the work that you want to make in a way that's efficient and practical so sounds beautiful yeah well luke over to you i know i'm watching the clock well um <laughs> yeah so heidi's got to get here i gotta a short one that's okay i'm always usually short anyway i didn't get the memo on share uh a million projects and be oh. mine so y'all you know <laughs> 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 all right let's see let's do a quick share screen oh come on now we'll get there we'll get there uh -huh. and while Luke is doing this, I'm going to say that there will be time for a little Q&A afterwards. I know, Heidi, you have to pop off in about 20 minutes, right? But Luke yes. and I will be around. So if you have questions for us, feel free to be thinking about those in the back of your mind. And we can talk with y'all afterwards. Yes, it'd be wonderful. Absolutely. So I, uh, <laughs> as always, am doing 100 things simultaneously. Um, so I picked one of the projects to share about. Uh, it's a project that I'm not sort of like Zach, well, very different than Zach. I was going to say like Zach in that it's hard to share on social media, uh, but it's hard for me to share because it's a very long project and it gets really confusing to share little bits of a project interspersed with other projects. Uh, Zach's was not sharing for very different reasons. But so this is a series called 10 by 10 by 10 because I have made 10 quilts and I am changing them 10 times and I'm having 10 shows of them. And so I've made 10 quilts and here are the first, the pictures of the first 10. Here's the, so it'll go front, back, front, back, uh, front, back. You can see the little number on the bottom uh, gets out of order. Number four here, there's the back of it there. Number seven here, the front and the back. These are all made out of sheets. Front number three, back number three. Uh, the sheets on the front are diagonal and the sheets on the back are horizontal. Um, the front, I made these, oh, I don't remember the exact size of it. We'll call it 160 inch quilt tops. And then I cut them into quadrants of four and then I flipped two of them and combined them. So that's how I have these fronts with this diagonal. So it's all made out of, I mean, you know, I probably got, well, we're, we'll, we'll stop at hundreds. I may have gotten a thousand sheets this last year. I would not be surprised. Um, but you can see that they're all made that way. And then the back is made out of these um, quadrants of the sheets and then sewn together. So the front is these diagonal and then the back are made out of these quadrants. And I tried not to editorialize when picking my sheets. I tried to, well, except for I just didn't want all white. I tried to grab anything with a pattern on it um, so that as I'm creating these objects, they have a narrative of the experience of the sheets of the community here in Los Angeles that were discarded at that very particular moment. So it's sort of a, a, a horizontal snapshot, a strata, if you will, of the discarded sheets. But what you don't end up with is you don't end up with one demographic of sheets. You know, it's not Grandma Thursdays or Kid Sheet Friday. It is all the sheets given out at the same time. So you end up with, um, you know, estate sales and kids, sheets and you get up with all of these different uh, materials put together to give you this kind of um, entry point into the the uh, material of our sort of private experience. And there's a lot to talk about um, as it relates to quilts and, and kind of this <clears throat> semi-private, right? I mean, quilts are a nostalgic object, but with that, they have a privacy to them in a way that I think is really interesting, right? It's a little vulnerable to 
uh, share a quilt and show a quilt, especially like take something off of your bed and then bring it out to the living room and say, hey, look at this, right? Like, well, ooh. and so, if, you know, and these are all being made out of sheets, right? Sheets are about safety and comfort and warmth and, and you know, these sort of like, like actively private moments. Um, and then to sort of put them out front, I think is a, is a dynamic sub conversation to these objects. So anyway, here's the first show of those first 10 quilts. And it's the same 10 quilts every time. I've just changed them. So here's the first show of those 10. And I put them in my backyard. <laughs> and so you can see uh, in the front yard. And so they are inhabiting space around my home. So they're creating this kind of architectural, environmental installation quality of um, sort of shade and privacy and an engagement with environments and you know friends came over had a bunch of fun snacks had some quilty cookies <laughs> um and just kind of engaged the environment with the quilts in the space uh before they got changed at all so that's first iteration of the 10 by 10 by 10 are these little environments of these quilts made out of sheets and they they are a bit of a Oh, uh, not diversion, but a, a bit of a side project in the sense that they are not um, intrinsically narrative, right? There's no subject, there's no figure ground relationship with these objects to begin with. They are um, kind of bland in a in a very intentional way. They started like this. So there's not, I mean, if I were to ask you to pick out one of, you know, what was quilt number four? I can't even do it. And I made the darn things. Um, so they are intentionally these sort of, um, design objects that then get to be challenged and changed. And so what I did for the second iteration of this project, uh, same quilts, but I shined a light through it. And on the other side of the quilts where the seam was, I put bias tape. So you can see every one of these black lines represents the seam of the back side. So if you remember the front side's diagonal and the back side's horizontal. So now these black lines are representing the other side of the quilt. So I get these shapes that are intrinsic to the quilt, but it doesn't make sense when you look at them necessarily um, what those lines are, right? On each side of the quilt, the lines are representing the work that's done on the other side. So it is necessarily both sided on each side. So you're able to sort of uh, understand the quilt as sculpture without having to necessarily navigate the space around it. And you'll see a lot more when I show you the exhibition images for this part of the series, why that was done, right? And so here you can see those lines that represent the seams of the other side. Um, you know, in this case, quilt number three on the horizontal side did not have a lot of seams. But quilt number three on the diagonal side had a whole lot of seams. So this is the back, this is the front. I say that with air quotes in the sense that they're not necessarily fronted and backed in a traditional way, except that uh, the hanging sleeve is on one side of it. And so you can see as I'm going through the line work, these, hor these um, horizontal and diagonal lines are just a reinforcement of the seam from the other side. And I don't have a zoom of it, but each of the seams here ends up being heavily quilted because it is stitching through to the other side uh, where that um, bias tape is to kind of reference it. So you get these really interesting, um, again, they're just lines on the quilt that don't necessarily make any sense, except they are intrinsic to the project. So I think it's really interesting uh, to be very, um, sort of pure to the object. It's it's very sort of architectural in the sense that it is about the material and the process, and it is not narrative or um, figural. It is about sort of using the object itself to create the the visual experience. I do like that one because it has dinosaurs. And so I made a show of this second iteration of this work by shining lights through them. So the show was at night. 
and each of the quilts were exhibited backlit. And they were hung in different uh, ways up in the air, lit from the top, um, down on the sidewalk, uh, you know, this way. So, so the exhibition was actually um, and a bit antithetical to the way that we understand quilts to be exhibited, right? And I'm I'm pushing this envelope, or not envelope, maybe agenda is the right word, <laughs> of quilts as sculpture objects. And I think that's so important. And so uh, lighting them from the back gives you this sort of third conversation, right? The quilts by themselves are either diagonal with horizontal lines or horizontal with diagonal lines. But now shining light through it, you get all of that. You get both sides of the lines and both sides of the fabric. And so you get these interstitial colors and these stained glass moments um, that would not have happened if they weren't shine, sh shown through. It'll go back one. So you can kind of see what it looks like to see if it's front lit as you would in sort of a gallery, it looks like that and it's cool and I think it's great, whatever. Uh, but when it's backlit, you see it as this experience of the object holding space in a very particular moment in time. As the wind blows it, as the light shines on it, it created these really beautiful um, sort of objects, right? Uh, and I think that's and that's really what I what I wanted to go for with this second iteration of the series is kind of holding a space uh, with these quilts as objects as sculpture three dimensionally sort of portrayed through use, the use of the lighting. And there you can get a little bit kind of a closer idea of what the line work did when you're shining light through it. So you don't see any of the seams because each seam is covered by a dark line. Uh, and I'll tell you, that was a bit of a pain. No, <laughs> I had to um, shine light. I was using a flashlight. I got my wife to go and pin these up in the yard and have my wife shine a flashlight behind it while I used a chalk pencil on the front and then the back to line each line. Then I had to put it on the long arm to, to fully quilt the whole thing down with each of those um, pieces of bias tape. So it wasn't particularly fun, <laughs> but I think that it ended up being very successful. Um, so again, this is the second iteration of 10 for this series right there. And thankfully a, a friend of mine here runs a company that supplies lighting and rigging for stage equipment. So I was able to team up with them and have this show to really showcase the works perfectly. Lucas, I, I was thinking you were going to tell us you had like a buddy pull up with their car and just shine their headlights through it or something. You know what? I'm normally, normally that's the way that I roll. But I mean, if I've got, you know what? You got the, <laughs> you got it. You might as well uh, flaunt it, right? So having a friend with the equipment, uh, I did it in the parking lot of their company. So, you know, all I had to do is schlep it outside and run some cords, which was great. Um, so now here is the third iteration that I just completed two weeks ago on this set of 10. And so what I have done is I have spliced two of them together. So this is quilt number 10, and it has a chunk of quilt number nine in it, which has a chunk of quilt number eight in it, which has a quilt of chunk of quilt numbers, chunk of quilt number seven in it. And so each of them have started to combine now. So it is now a inextricably linked series of work because each of them is combined together. And so what's really nice is you get some of these different lines that are crossing um, that are from one quilt to the next. And so it's all the exact same shape. So each of the 10 quilts has the same shape put into it, but it's from the quilt previous. So for example, uh, here, I've got a slide in a second that'll help explain it. Um, and so now I think they're starting to get really dynamic. When I started the, this particular series, as I had said, the intention was for them to be um, kind of a, a blanket, LOL, of, of kind of uh, sheets and kind of this boring uh, blanket, right? Um, sort of like a, you know, a, a, a flat experience upon which to iterate 10 times. And now that we're at the third iteration, I'm starting to see some really interesting things happen, right? This quilt is pretty spicy compared to what it was 
uh, when it was just the sheets. There's all these black lines that are important and integral to the quilt because they reference the other side. There's this shape put in it that is interesting because it references another quilt in this same series. And so here's three together that you can see how they are uh, pieces of the other one. So for example, if you look at the, the wiggle shape on quilt number 10 on the left side, and you see the red kind of in its upper tendril. And if you look at quilt number nine, you can see where that red um, diamond was. And so you can see that that was actually taken out of quilt number nine and put into quilt number 10. Similarly, the piece was taken out of quilt number eight and put into quilt number nine. So you can see in quilt number eight, there's this kind of, um, uh, you know, young boy sport sheets, <laughs> uh, you know, basketballs and baseballs and soccer and cool guy. And so ch those chunks have now been put into quilt number nine. And so they each have this kind of um, meshing between them. And so it is now, they are no longer sort of autonomous objects, but they are in a, a round series because the chunk from quilt number 10 is in quilt number one. So the whole thing kind of like Zach's book is gonna be, it's a round circle that always references itself uh, as far down as you go. Uh, and I just think it's a, a pretty cool, a cool project and a cool idea to push myself. And one of the, the sort of subtexts for this um, is that uh, I'm producing all of the shows myself. Um, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm having the show as I'm, you know, I'm doing it all. And it's kind of a way for me to create a dialogue of audience that is, a, that is divorced slightly from the um, sort of institutional uh, sort of gatekeepers, because I've had some frustrations with that, you know, galleries, museums, and it's just difficult to do that work. And, you know, good on them. They need to, they need to put up a good show. So they, of course, need to have some barriers to just letting any old person do it. But Sometimes that's difficult for any old person. So I'm just doing the shows myself uh, for this particular series. Um, I've certainly got some shows coming up in different places around the country, museums, galleries, et cetera, which are awesome. But for this one, this is kind of a, a private show for myself, which I thought was a fun way to, or just a, you know, a softball being a fun platform to talk and share about that. <clears throat> and one last thing to say uh, before we get into a little Q and A, um, is I was asked to be on a podcast recently. It's part of the Armchair Expert with Dak Shepard, um, and uh, they they have a they have a podcast that's a New Zealander who moved to the United States who doesn't know anything about America and is interviewing people about things American. And so they asked me to be on the Quilt podcast. And so I got to be on the quilt podcast. And so what I'm doing before the podcast launched is making a quilt of the, the host of the show um, for them as a kind of way to, to get some more quilting into their, their media. So fingers crossed they like it and show it, but um, you know, a fun experience and a fun way to get some quilts out there. Um, yeah. And I'll be teaching a portrait class. If anybody's interested in making their own portraits, find it on loop.art, pretty easy. Um, you know, it's a, a simple class. I teach it once a year um, and uh, you get the recording. So even if you can't make it in person, you'll have access to it. So stop screen sharing. A simple little project. That way, Heidi, I kind of zoomed through it. So you have, uh, I guess, a minute left <laughs> to be able to. Keep it. Um... They're so beautiful with the light. And I love the spirit of DIY and being local, exhibiting it. And um, I'm curious about like the things that will come next. Uh, have you, I'm imagining that it's somewhat improvisational and you don't know what all 10 iterations will be. But on the other hand, do you know what <laughs> all 10 will be? Have you seen it? Oh. Your no, mind? I mean, so uh, my intention is that each time I have the exhibition, I learn something and I say, that's what's cool. I'm going to push that in the next one, right? So the first one, when I hung it outside, the light shining through it from the sun was like, okay, that's cool. So then the next show I did with the light shining through it very much intentionally and putting those black lines on it to reinforce the intentionality of 
uh, the light of it. And so now I've put these kind of shapes on it to give them more sort of cohesion and narrative, right? So now they are not kind of disparate blankets. They are a um, a series of 10, like, like linked 10 objects. And so um, I'll, I'm working on right now, finding a good place to display them. There's a couple parks I'm thinking of doing a gorilla show in uh, so that I can hang them there so that you can kind of engage with them uh, all the way around. Hmm. Could and one I'll be a fashion show? I'm just thinking of like Zach putting that quilt over. Like, could one just be 10 <laughs> people wearing the quilts? <laughs> What's really fun about this project is that, you know, it gets your mind going, right? So mm -hmm. I, I could easily make a list of 10, uh, impositions to 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 create quilts right now no question easy but the 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 hard part is actually waiting until having the exhibition and being inspired by the experience so that i'm actually working with these specific objects right because i have a lot of quilt ideas that i could just project onto these either literally or metaphorically and um, get it done, no problem, don't have to leave the studio. But the idea here is that the iterative nature of this show is actually engaging with displaying or viewing or you know whatever happens to it through that experience. Maybe they get dirty and maybe they, you know, and so it is actually a very real uh, dialogue with this process of showing, making, changing, um, which I think is really beautifully implicit to quilts in a way, right, mending, uh, the sort of handwork that happens, the stretching, the um, the fraying, the fading. I mean, you know, Zach, you had that chenille blanket that came through. Heidi, obviously, there's so much handwork in your garments and objects that are the sort of um, residue of living in the world. So, the, you know, the velveteen rabbit, I talk about way too much when people come by the studio. I'm like, you know, they're, these are real quilts because they've been loved. <laughs> you know, they've <laughs> been on the bed, they have you know, rips and stains. And like, uh, I definitely get some um, big eyed stares from curators and collectors when they see how they're stored or displayed or shown uh, because I find them to be, they are the language of my work. They aren't necessarily the work itself, right? So these 10 uh, are linked together and the experience of seeing the 10 is what is important. Each one individually in a beautiful picture that's sort of hermetically clean and put in a postcard is not necessarily the work. It is a reference to the work. And I think that is what's important and kind of different about the way that I think about it. Oh my God, that makes my brain tingle with like, what if it could be like a soul lewitt thing where you've got the instructions for 10 and maybe an art museum could say, hey, Luke, we want to do your 10 quilts thing. Can yeah. we you know, do all 10 of those, those moves and exhibitions and. That would be wonderful. There was a, there was an amazing exhibition I saw. I think it was, oh, Lordy me. I forget what museum it was, um, but uh, maybe the High Museum in Atlanta. Either way, there were these two, I think they were a partner, two men makers, they're, 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 they're sculptors. And they built a wall down the middle of the space and they both had a pile of wood and tools. And so their goal was to make a an exactly um, symmetrical building on either side with only using words. So they would say, I am cutting a two by four at four feet, three inches, and I am screwing it to the leftmost corner of the platform that we made yesterday. And I am then put, so only with the words. And so the viewer then can come in and see as it's being built, the slight variations that happened in the language that came through uh, just the wall between. And it was just a, a beautiful experience of sort of tactile versus mental. I mean, it's, you know, it's all a wit in a different way, but. Yeah. yeah. Well, and like quilts just don't have the same archival qualities as paintings or marble anyways. And so rather than fighting that saying yes and is exciting. Mm. Okay, I'm I'm going to leave and go to physical therapy for my right shoulder. It's my first appointment, which those are hard to make. Um, I messed something up in July. I do not think it was a quilting related injury, but that is a different story. What I think it is related to. Um, so carry on. I will unspotlight myself and 
Uh, and then the recording will be up on YouTube later. Please make sure you comment and like and subscribe and all of that. And Luke and Zach have beautiful YouTube channels now too. So those will be linked as well as lots of other links in the caption for the recording. Thank you both. It's so good to see you again. Good to see you, Heidi. Good luck at physical therapy. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll fill you in on whatever happens in the next few minutes as Q and A. I'll watch. Yeah. No need. That's true. That's okay, true. That's I, true. Apparently, I can't unspotlight myself because I made you the co host. Oh. <laughs> All Bye, right, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, Luke, maybe you answered this and I was tuned out, or maybe you definitely sidestepped it. In which case, feel free to sidestep it again. But when Heidi was inquiring about next steps and your response was, oh, I take each exhibition and I'm, I'm looking for that spark, that thing. When you put in your squiggles in round three yeah. of this, did you catch a glimpse of what round four might look like? I know because I, I haven't had the show yet. My goal is that it's the physical experience of finishing and, and displaying so that there is a, a an actual dialogue because one of the one of the one of the variables as a maker as an artist as a creator is people seeing the work and like some people don't care about that and that's no problem some people care exclusively about that and that's no problem you know I try to be somewhere in the middle where I'm actively making work that an audience will enjoy, right? Like it's not exclusively for, uh, you know, the experience of making, which if I do, that's great, but then I don't have to show it, right? So the hope for me in this show is that putting it up and having an audience will help me cue into what they, you know, if everybody goes over and starts crinkling and touching it, well, I got to put on fuzzy material, right? Like, or I got to, you know what I mean? Or I have to build in gloves into every quilt, you know, in some way, like whatever it is, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm hoping, <laughs> the hope is that I've got these sort of blinders on that I get to sort of open myself up to it only when it's displayed. Whether that's accurate or not, we shall see. Well, then one more question. Feel free to pass if you want. But how tied are you to ending 10 by 10 by 10 with 10 quilts still physically present? Like, is there room for destruction in the <laughs> series? And feel free to pass. As a, as a maker, and you'll actually uh, probably respond to this as well, there is a, um, well, no, I mean, you you don't have any intention of your work being sold, but you do want to share it and display it and ship it and whatever. And so like, there needs to be something that is not smelly or in a jar or, uh, you know, sort of on fire that you can ship to, you know, the mocha, you know, whatever, right? So, um, I'm trying, I'm like, I, you have to play the, there's sort of a gambit of like ego versus uh, exploration, right? So I, I like, I don't know is the answer. Like I'm trying to be open to it, but I really want at the end of it to have sort of beautiful artifacts to be able to uh, sell and acquire to, you know, institutions and, you know, like have a have a have an exhibition of the objects that have a reference to 10 experiences. Um, so I, I don't know but we'll see, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's sort of the long answer there is like, you know, yeah. You're a genius. Well, and well. when I was hearing myself say that, watching your presentation, there's actually a lot of curse words in there because I'm just so in awe of how this thing just keeps tessellating, right? And we're just a third of the way through it. Like I'm so stoked to see the, the, the second, the last two thirds of this, this uh, me, me too, which is really fun. So my brain often works through design and then completing, right? So I've created an idea, I go out and I make it, and then I decide if I did a good job, right? In this case, it's very different. Uh, I've sort of created a process that I have to be more present, which is which is cool and interesting and you know dynamic, I think, and uh, antithetical to quilting in a lot of ways. Because if you want to make a blanket, say, you got to get enough fabric to make it the size you want, and that could be small or that could be king size, blah de blah. But um, you have to get all the fabric for that. You can't be wrong. You can be wrong, but only by a slight variation. And so, sort of quilting has built into it 
a system of knowing what's coming. Even if you go by fabric halfway through to finish or you have, you know, you still have to say, I'm making it for this size or, you know, I've got a sewing machine, so I'm using it, et cetera. So I think there's something built in to um, quilting that is not so, you know, I think one of the reasons that improv is a word that's bandied around so much, it's like imbuing a little bit of present spirit to quilting, even though you're like, okay, we're going to improv. However, you need to have this color fabric and this kind of a machine and this kind of thread and you have to get ready and we're showing up at this time. And like, that's fun and it's fine. I just mean it's it's interesting to try to push some of those boundaries instead of like the physical object uh, improvisational, the sort of long term of the object improvisational. Well, we got Why it. Not? We, we, I, I think it's a great time to segue to questions. I see Susan. Hi, Susan. What's on your mind? Unmute Susan and let ask tell tell us. So my question to you, Luke, it um, as somebody who often has really big ideas and jumps in feet first, is do you ever worry that you might run out of meaningful things to do before you hit ten? Never. Like, no, <laughs> I mean just because I'm so I'm so wowed by. And there will be, you will be able to, to look at each quilt and say, okay, so here's the part that is where it started. And then here's the part that changed with two. And here's the part that changed with three. And here's the part that changed with four and still end up with something that isn't, to use the British term, dog's vomit, but is something interesting and has its own intrinsic beauty, but that, shows all 10 things but then I also think god I hope he doesn't run around and say I can't really think of a next step that doesn't totally ruin what I'm doing with these you know not that you wouldn't have more ideas but that more ideas that wouldn't feel like you were ruining the beauty you were building so anyway because I sometimes feel like I'm in the deep end and I think oh man I got in over my head now what do I do I feel a little bit like the guy who built the boat in his basement sometimes with my art I mean, I will say, uh, now what do I do <laughs> like how, how wonderful to be done right like how wonderful if iteration four and then I have this sort of epiphany of <laughs> you know what I mean like uh, you know how wonderful to be done um and I think that's there is a challenge as a maker to do some stuff that, uh, you know, colloquially Britishly looks like dog vomit so that you recognize the next time where to stop. I mean, my goal as a maker is exclusively to make the next thing I make better than anything I've made. So if I'm not so great this time, that is also a brilliant step in the right direction. And that's not to say that I intend for it to go south, mind you, I really want it to be cool. And just like you said, but, if that opportunity arises, then I get to say thank you <laughs> and, uh, you know, what to learn. Uh, Charlotte has their their hand up as well. Hey. Oh. Um, hi there. Thank you so much. This is really interesting. Just sort of following on Susan's question. Are there any, um, and I do have a little bit of an agenda with this question, just a little <laughs> one. Um, are there any um, actions that you would consider like off limits for the quilts. And the reason I ask that is I know in past soft, soft bulk um, sessions, you've shared some really beautiful quilts that you dyed. And I'm just wondering if like dying is, uh, is on the table or like, I don't know, or attaching or something is, is on the table. Or do you, or do you have anything that's off or definitely off the table I, i'm probably not asking this question the right way but anyway i was just curious no no it's a great question and the answer is you know for this iteration this series is about exploring exploring and um again like i said to susan like uh what if i'm wrong i know how to make these things like i don't want to go spend another 300 mf and hours making them but i can so if i go very wrong I get to say thank you and go cry for a while and then start over or start the next one. Um, a beautiful thing about dyeing the quilts that I've been making out of discarded sheets is that they're 
their their thread material is so different. So if I dunk each of these, the polyester is going to take it real different than the cotton, than the half poly. And so what ends up happening, and I've done it quite a number of times with the tops from this series, um, is, is I've actually got a really beautiful range of tones. Some of them don't die at all. Some of them take it really deep. And so I actually, so there, there's actually a beauty that comes in dying. So there it's, it's on the table <laughs> and I have experimented, but we shall see. Yeah. What's yeah. It? it makes me think of you. I think it's a blue flying geese quilt that you made Luke that had some red poly in it. And so when you dyed everything else blue, you have these bright red flying geese popping out. Yeah. It was a, a white and red, red and white quilt of big flying geese an entire 90 by 90 quilt of red flying geese made out of used clothing. And the, the clothing type didn't matter when I made it. And then it didn't have anything to do with the top. And I had had it for years and I was just schlepping it around the world as I moved. So I just dumped it in a big tub of indigo and then the polyester and then the half poly, they, would, they didn't take the dye. So there were these bright red triangles and then everything else was this sort of modeled tone of blue, which is a really nice artifact of the making process that I didn't anticipate. That's magic. Yeah. Zach, you have a question in the chat. Oh. Uh, so it says, What's it say? I don't even see it. It says, I'm curious if you would care to share any uh, unexpected self discoveries that have come about during your three projects. Unexpected self-discovery moments. I think I want to give that some real good thought because I don't, off the top of my head. No, I mean, I will say it was really interesting when I ended up creating that one quilt at Aramont that was so similar to Mamaw's quilt. That felt like a really interesting, like I knew what I needed without knowing on a uh, conscious level what I need to do. So that was a really interesting moment. No, I'll have to give that some more thought. That's a good question. Thank you. I think it's an interesting question too. And also from the outside to just say that the whole process was about um, sort of processing discoveries that you had been given, right? So like it'd be, you know, like there, there already is uh, an implicit self-discovery, right? Your family has this history. Uh, members of your family have this reaction um, you know, the artifacts and experience of being a human living in the South, making objects, finding discarded material, like those are all inherently discoveries that you are using to present these physical narratives in some ways. So that's an, it is an interesting question to sort of like, who are you on the other side of it? Yeah, because the making of the pieces is also the processing. So part of the processing happens in the research phase, and then part of the process happens during the, the making phase. There have been, I mean, tangential to the making is the research. And part of the research was on ancestry.com where you know you, you do your little sample and they, they link you with all these other people they think you're family with and you're related to. And it was, um, it should not have been surprising, but the specificity of it was really interesting that, you know, once you scroll through your your second cousin matches and your third cousin matches. This is a bunch of white folks. By the time you hit fourth cousin matches in my family tree, I start seeing more and more people of color and seeing specific faces that share DNA with me hmm. and fairly close DNA. It only goes back maybe four or five generations was really gave me a very different understanding of even just walking down the street. Like I, re I mean, it sounds like I mean, it almost sounds like, I don't know, like a hallucination or something. Right. But like after, after that, first moment of like scrolling through and seeing those people who I'm related to that have a different skin color than I do walking down the street here in my neighborhood to the grocery store was an entirely different experience the world got so much smaller and more interconnected and that's a moment that I wish more of us could experience somehow or some way I, th I think I think um sort of linear history is a nice way to do that but also like horizontal uh, activities, right? Like, you know, quilting is um, getting more and more diverse, which is wonderful, uh, you know, but like, I mean, just, you know, going to the grocery store is, is another, you know, like, like I remember living in New York, right? Just like moving to New York from a small town, Southern Appalachia was like, okay, now my neighbors are different than my neighbors were. And <laughs> yeah. 
And ultimately, it feels really good to me. You know, having spent a bunch of time in a place like New York and a bunch of time in small towns, love them both for different reasons. But here in New York, there, there are 8 million ways to be a beautiful human being in this city. Right? And it can look very different one to the next. If I'm in a place that's more like Gatlinburg, let's say, there's, there's one or two ways to be a beautiful human being, you know? So I feel more comfortable surrounded by all these potential beautiful options in a place like New York. Doesn't yeah. mean, though, that my heart doesn't call for, like, smaller town and closer to family and all that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting point. The Yeah. Lots of, there's a lot to think about. And, yeah, there's just, yeah, a lot, a lot to think about. And I think it ties in a nice way to uh you and your work and your objects and how they exist in the world right like us as makers us the audience you me Heidi you know everyone listening everyone who's gonna listen like we we make things and put them into the world on us on whatever scale we choose um that could mean uh that could that could go you know that could mean dinner to uh, an entire exhibition of quilt work and I you know I'm not at all putting any parameters on on making, but I do think that it is important to recognize that there is nary a human who is not a maker. Uh, I think there is, however, a vast majority of humans who don't recognize it as making, right? There's a there's a expectation to, well, I'm just putting dinner on because I've got to eat, or my family has to eat, or my neighbor has, but you know, you're 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 physically making something, you know, and that obviously translates well into a career like you and I have of making objects for display and sale and conversation, et cetera. But I think that there's there's a breadth to everyone's experience that we can we can as humans be enriched by what what people are making. I mean they called our ancestors Homo habilis because we were handy makers. <laughs> you know, I'm wondering if there are any other questions, now's a great time to put them in the chat or to raise your hand. But if you if you like hearing me and Luke talk, it reminds me that we recently had on Scene Side a free advice episode where Luke and I took four of your questions out of the many that were submitted and opined on them. And it's been one of the more popular episodes on Scene Side. So if if you like this, there's more where that came from. Yeah, and you also know how to find us. We're happy to yeah. Zach and I are always happy to opine. So feel free to drop them in, but also <laughs> find us later. We would love any excuse to do it longer. I'm speaking for both of us, which I may only be speaking for me, but, you know, here we are. <laughs> All right. Let's see if a couple questions pop up here. Sheena, I would love to hear about how Luke goes about his self-exhibiting part of his practice and if there are parallels for him in crafting these events as in creative quilts. Ooh, that's a really so, great question, mm -hmm. Sheena. So, so, like... How do you go about exhibiting? Exhibiting, oh Lord, we could have an entire uh, very long conversation about exhibiting. It is probably the most important part of my practice. I have had 170 shows in I, you know, seven countries and 35 states and whatever. Like the the, the vast, you know, I, I have a very wide breadth of experience exhibiting um, because that's one of my goals. And uh, putting the work up is very important and how you put it up and how you choose to explain to people what to respect about the work um, and also what the environment it is. And then finding people to show up and making people show up and getting people to show up is a real, uh, <laughs> a, whole, a whole thing. Um, but, but yes, to answer, to answer the specificity to your question, um, crafting the experience is part of the craft, right? So like, do you hang the quilt above you? So you walk under it? Do you hang it close? Do you hang it far away? Do you put it on a wall? Do you hang it off the wall? Do you hang it by one corner? Do you stretch it? Like all of those are simple choices that make a very big difference in how you can access the object as a viewer. And so I think it is an important part to the conversation uh, to ask oneself, you know, as you're presenting work, you know, can you ball it up and throw it on the ground? Um, you know, I've had I've had that show, <laughs> right? And like some people like it and quilters don't because they want to see if my points match and my stitches and like that's all fine and well. And you know, there's 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 like communities who like certain things and that's great. And like which one are you wanting to talk to? And like you're trying to piss someone off, call it a blanket and put it on the ground. Like, you know what I mean? And that's all right. Uh 
<laughs> and like it really comes down to I think some intentionality there. So well, good question. I yeah, very much. Let's see. Well, this question's for me. I see sometimes that Zach posts in Middle Valley near Hickson, Tennessee. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Patrick. I appreciate it. I do go. I got family in that area, so that is very nice. That is very nice. I appreciate that, Patrick. Yeah, somebody asked me once recently, I mean, to the point of like crafting exposition and objects, someone asked me recently, like what I think about when I'm working on a quilt. I'm like, I think about the quilt. I think about the stories I want to tell about the quilt. I'm thinking about what stories the quilt's telling me, right? It does feel very much of a piece, making the object, thinking about the object, thinking about the performance of the object after it's done, my relationship to it. At one point, I'm the maker of the object, and later I'm the the mouthpiece for the object, you know, I'm the caretaker of the object. And I think you can see a, a difference of, I mean, the word intimacy comes up in Zach's work versus my work, right? Like, like that piece where you unstitched all 2048, 14.92 uh, of your, your ancestors off of it. And you left that residue of the experience. Like you got to get up close and then you got to say, like, you know, then you're like, oh, there's that texture of, of his handwork, right? And like, and that's very intimate. You created, you created an awning that you had to kind of, you know, turtle your way under to experience it. Uh, whereas I try to create environments and some, you know, and like both of us do both, absolutely. And by no means to sort of pigeonhole us, but I just, you know, to kind of spark the conversation in here and in people's brains is like, how close do you want someone to be? And what is that intimacy? And is it an experience of an environment or is it an experience of an object? And is it an experience of a portion of an object? Is it an experience of a portion of a portion of an object? And like, where is, where do the work where it's important? And I think that is a, a very esoteric thing that can really mean a lot to people's work, right? Do, you know, there's a lot of painters historically who, um, painted a did a lot of where all oh, that's a photorealistic face and hair and their hands on it, but then the rest of it is just a wash of brown. So you know the portraits about the person, but where they're sitting doesn't matter, right? That's a very sort of one to one example of do the work where you want people to see the work. Uh, and I think Zach and I do that in, in different ways, right? Like I'm gonna make ten of these things so that you know that one of them's on purpose because if I did it ten times by golly, he did that on purpose, you know, and Zach's going to make one and it's going to take as long as it takes me to make 10. Mine are a little sloppy and his is precise, but because you, he wants you to see how each of the letters and each of those words mean something to his family and his self in a very staunch physical experience of existing as a human in the world. And those two things are very different, but I think you can see them in the work and sort of that's the the teacher and me sort of pushing that as pedagogy is sort of referencing what you can see in each work to then know what's important to the maker. Which is, you know, I often think like, why does this thing I'm making have to be a quilt? Yeah. Why, especially when it comes to my textier pieces, like why don't I just grab a marker and a poster board and just write the exact same words? But my hope is, and my hunch is, that by taking the deliberate time to sit there and stitch every single letter, that care is transferred to the viewer who says, okay, if this is so important that this person spent hours stitching this thing down, maybe I'll give it 30 seconds of contemplation. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, like if you look at the, what is it? The Grand Rapids Art Prize every year, it's the biggest sort of uh, uh, viewer voted art prize every year. Michigan, I don't know all the details. They get a check for a hundred grand, something crazy, right? Most of the time, it is something that has impressed the viewers through sheer volume of 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 like action, whether it's a photorealistic massive painting or there was a quilt that won, but it's lots of little pieces. And, you know, so like as viewers, I think there's something that we trust. We, <laughs> we trust volume, right? If it took you that long, then you did it on purpose. You know, you're not going to accidentally make a quilt. Everyone here knows that. You're not going to be like, ah, I have this extra fabric. I guess I'll just make a quilt because I don't know what to do with it, right? It's not just goulash. It's like, <laughs> right? So I think there's something, it's something to that. And maybe we'll end on this note unless somebody pops in another question. That is, Kim would like us to consider making a quilt con 
just for like repurposed material-based quilts. Love that idea. Maybe one day in the future, there's room for that in the world. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm always ready to do exhibitions, Zach. You let me know. Yeah. I'll find us a space. That's not a problem. You got a buddy with a car with a pair of headlights? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Luke. I, I got some more questions for you. I'm going to talk to you off air. Okay. Okay. Listen, all y'all still hanging out there with us, all 55 of you, thank you for staying and thinking with thank us. Thank you and... for doing this, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Y'all take care, and we'll, our paths will cross again soon. Okay. You have the button to stop the recording? I right? think I do. I'm looking for the button now. I only have a button to start recording. <laughs> Wait, maybe. Uh, no, it is. I, I don't know. I think we can just end it. I think it just ends it. Let's find out. Because I don't have a stop recording button anymore. Okay, so I'm just going to, I'm going to hit end and I'm going to text you. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody.